Hey guys, it's Nephi. Thank you for joining me once again, and welcome to episode two of our series, God of Our Ancestors. Today we're going to be exploring the life of Elizabeth. That's it, that's her name. She calls herself Elizabeth, a colored minister of the gospel. And she was a bold and remarkable woman, although I doubt she would describe herself that way. It took her many years to begin preaching after she received the initial call, trying to work up the courage to do so. But when she did it, she did it with such power and such authority. And well, without further ado, let's jump in. So Elizabeth was born in Maryland in 1766, 10 years before the country even became an independent nation. Both her parents were Methodists and her father used to read to them from the Bible every Sunday morning. She was separated from her parents when she was about 10 or 11 years old. And this caused a great depression on her for weeks. All she could do was cry. She felt like she was going to die. So she throws herself on the ground one day and expects to die. And she's laying there feeling like she wants like she's unprepared to meet her maker. And then she said she heard a voice that told her, get on your knees and pray. So she gets on her knees and begins to pray. And the only prayer she really knows is the Lord's prayer. After she says it, she doesn't know what else to say. So she just remains there kneeling. She says the words were given to her to pray. Lord have mercy on me, Christ save me. She said immediately after she says these words, she has a vision of an angel dressed in all white who takes her on this like cliff, I guess. It's like a precipice where there is like lava and fire beneath her. She said she prayed and prayed for salvation, but it seemed to be in vain. But somehow she felt that she was being held up or sustained by an invisible power. At that moment, she saw a hand and that hand was holding a, a thread of hair, very thin, and said to her that all of the hope that she had to be saved was as thin as this hair, this strand of hair. But if she prayed, that would be enough and she would receive salvation. She rose her, her eyes and saw straight forward the Savior standing with his arms stretched out towards her, surrounded by a glorious light. And he said to her, peace, peace, come unto me. And in that moment, she felt that her sins were forgiven of her. She jumped to her feet, singing praises to God. She said the angel that had initially taken her to the pit now took her to heaven's door, where she saw millions of people clothed in white and heard a voice that asked her, are you willing to be saved? And she said, yes, Lord, I am. And the voice asked her several times, to which she repeated yes. But then the voice said, are you willing to be saved in my way? And she didn't know what to say to that. And then the voice says, you can only be saved if you're willing to be saved in my way. So she, of course, agrees. Then she's hit with a light and she feels filled with light and she sees the world beneath her lying in wickedness. She was told that she had to go there and to warn people, to call them to repentance because the day of the Lord was at hand. She felt this was a heavy burden and she began to cry. She heard a voice say, weep not. Some will laugh at thee, some will scoff at thee and the dogs will bark at thee. But while thou doest my will, I will be with thee to the ends of the earth. She said she lived in a place where there was no preaching, no religious instruction. Um, she was no longer with her parents. So what she would do is go into the hay bales and into the haystacks and pray until she just had this overwhelming sense of joy. And that was her habit that she would do every day until one day somebody came and told her she was silly for doing that because other Christians, you don't see them going to pray for so long every day. So it kind of discouraged her. And this was part of her trial. This was part of her trial trying to um, answer the call that God had given her and do the things that she felt impressed to do while worrying about what other people had to say about it. And I think we can all kind of relate to that. And so that's her struggle, that if, in her narrative, you see that kind of theme repeating itself. Her burden, her, you know, we all have a trial. Her trial was to um, maintain her um, diligence, to maintain her duty to God, her faithfulness to God in doing what he asked her to do 
despite what other people had to say and how they would make her feel about what she knew he told her to do. And so we see that in her life in the form of in her later years um, when she finally obtains her freedom, which she was sold to a Presbyterian who didn't believe in holding slaves indefinitely. So he gave her a fixed number of years and at the expiration of those years, she was set free. She was given her freedom. She was 30 years old when she was set free. Um, and then the call came to her, like the Lord said to her at the time, is now for you to do the things that I've been telling you to do, which was to preach the gospel. Now you've got to think, this is the late 1700s. And not only is she a former slave, but she's, you know, a woman and she's being told to preach the gospel. So this is a heavy burden on her. Um, but the Lord was with her and gave her, you know, tokens of his presence with her. So one day she's told to go to a widow and ask her, this particular woman, to let her hold a meeting in her house. And people come to the meeting, mainly women, to come hear what she has to say and to pray together. And back then they had uh, patrols who would come to see if the slaves were praying because it was forbidden for them to pray. Um, to find out more about that, you can research the invisible institution. It is the fact that it highlights the fact that slaves had to hide their Christianity in many cases and find ways to sneak about having worship services or just praying um, because they might get caught and beat. And so here in this woman's house, a patrol comes because they're making noise in the middle of the night to inquire as to what they're doing. And Elizabeth is praying, and when she looks up, half the people have gone except for one older woman and the woman who owns the house. Let's read from her narrative. A feeling of weakness came over me for a short time, but I soon grew warm and courageous in the spirit. The man then said to, then said to me, I was sent here to break up your meeting. Complaint has been made to me that the people around here cannot sleep for the racket. I reply, a good racket is better than a bad racket. How do they rest when the ungodly are dancing and fiddling till midnight? Why are they not molested by the watchman? And why should we be for praising God, our maker? Are we worthy of greater punishment for praying to him? And are we to be prohibited from doing so that sinners may remain slumbering in their sins? Speaking several words more, he turned pale and trembled and begged my pardon, acknowledging that it was not his wish to interrupt us and that he would never disturb a religious assembly again. He then took leave of me in a comely manner and wished us success. This is unheard of. Like, she, she rebuked him and he took it and he left. Ordinarily, they would have gotten some sort of physical abuse and told to be quiet and then she would never have been allowed to preach there again. I do think that they still did not allow her to have a meeting in that house again. So part of her struggle was finding places that would accept her um, in her ministry. And she says that the majority of her, of her persecution, the majority of her struggles came at the hands of those who were fellow members of her uh, denomination because they didn't feel it was um, they didn't feel it was permissible for a woman to preach but she knew that God had called her to do so so once again I'm not going to give you all the details of her story her story is linked in the description box there's not a lot of information about Elizabeth you know we had photos of Josiah Henson last episode but we don't have that for Elizabeth we don't even have a last name for Elizabeth uh, but we still do have her story told in her in, in her own words so what can we learn from her I think not only was she a former slave but she was a woman and Again, her, per her greatest persecutions came from other Christians in her own denomination who tried to stop her from preaching the gospel. But she resolutely held on to God and decided to do what he called her to do despite, despite the fact that she was mocked, right? And laughed at. And God gave her both inspiration and strength. They even tried to make her doubt her own experience with him saying that God no longer granted vision or spoke to people in the way that she was describing that he was speaking to her. And I think that people will do that to you. People will try to make you feel like you're crazy or try to make you feel, make, make you doubt the word of the Lord in your own life. And you have to go by what you know to be true, right? Um, and she did that despite all odds, despite all of these circumstances against her. You know, I can't think of a, 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 a more <laughs> or a least inviting environment for a woman to preach the gospel than in her day and time and in her condition. But she served, she served God to the best of her ability, which is a testimony I think we all would like to have um, in our own memory. So the one quote that stands out to me is the following. When I went forth, it was out purse or script. And I have come through great tribulation 
and temptation, not by any might of my own, for I feel that I am but as dust and ashes before my almighty helper, who has, according to his promise, been with me and sustained me through all, and gives me now firm faith that he will be with me to the end, and in his own good time, receive me into his everlasting rest. In her later years, Elizabeth would go on to open a school for black orphans. Once again, just like uh, last episode, we see people who not only have their own freedom and are satisfied with that, but feel that their obligation to contribute something to the improvement of life for other people. And that is the Christian call. Stay Christian, stay black, stay woke.